thanks everyone for joining uh, this evening this morning wherever you are from coming uh, you know appreciate you all coming into the selenium light conference this is kind of the precursor for the main event or like I like to tell my team that this is kind of a test for the main event. So we kind of <laughs> test if everything is in place and we can, you know, kind of go from there. So uh, I would love to introduce Simon, uh, who's going to be kicking off the light event. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Simon. He's uh, been the author of uh, WebDriver, done a whole bunch of things with Selenium. I would say today Selenium is Selenium for a large degree because of Simon's uh, contributions. So Simon is going to be talking about some of the uh, CI related stuff, which uh, is an extremely important part. In fact, I think of it as a lifeline for most projects. So Simon's going to be talking about that today and sharing his wisdom of, uh, you know, how, how this project, uh, the Selenium project itself uses this. So without much delay, I think I want to hand it over to you, Simon. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, very kind of you. And uh, it's fantastic to be here back at Selenium Conf or Selenium Conf Flight. Um, let's find out that everything works. Um, as Narek said, if you've been part of the Selenium community for a while, you may know me as the person who led the Selenium project from 2009 until the end of 2021. Um, but if not, it's nice to meet you and have a chance to talk to you. Um, now, normally in these kinds of talks, I introduce like new features or talk about the direction of the project. But today I thought I'd take a different approach. Um, hopefully, if you're here at Selenium Conf, you believe in the value of automated testing and you probably have a CI pipeline. So I thought I'd explain a little bit about how we build and test Selenium itself and why I think you might want to look at adopting some of the tools and techniques we used. Now, this here is a screenshot of the current source of GitHub uh, in GitHub. As you can see, uh, the Selenium repo is effectively a mono repo containing bindings for Java, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, <laughs> and JavaScript in the same tree. The language bindings all share some common code, which is written in JavaScript, which we call the atoms because they're the smallest indivisible unit of browser automation. These are compiled using the Google Closure Compiler to create minified lumps of JavaScript that we pull into each of the bindings. The support for Chrome's own debugging protocol, the CDP, is also shared between languages, with code generators wrapping the raw JSON descriptions of the CDP to create language-specific implementations. Of course, not only do we have language bindings, but we also have the Selenium server in the same tree, and this is written in Java with a React-based web UI. Finally, we try and share as much of our test code as possible, and this includes shared web pages for test cases and a basic web server to set these out. As you can see here, the code is primarily organized at the top level of the project by language. And then within each language, we organize by whatever seems right for that language. When we started the project, it was a little unusual to arrange a code like we do now. Nowadays, with the rise of complex UIs written in JavaScript and protobufs being more widely used, it's increasingly common to find these polyglot code bases. That is those with a mix of languages all within the same repo. Even if you're not using lots of languages, things like Docker and Kubernetes are changing how we perceive how code can and should be built. So Selenium is a project and code base that's almost ideally suited to being built with a build tool that can handle multiple different languages. I think more projects are starting to head into this world. And um, before I begin describing what we do now, I think it might be helpful to see how we got to where we are. When I joined the Selenium project in 2009, there was one person left who understood how the whole build worked. The bulk of the code was in Java, so it was natural to use Maven back then. This was great for the server-side pieces, but for the language bindings, there was an obvious problem. People wanted the APIs for all supported languages to match and to keep pace with each other. To solve this problem, the API was described in an XML document, and this was transformed using XSLT into the specific language bindings. Maven would then delegate to each language's native build tool to compile and, and package these language bindings properly. Needless to say, there was a surprising amount of stuff that was needed to get the build working, and it depended quite heavily on the developer having set up the machine just so. Building away from Windows was somewhat tricky for the obvious reason that .NET wasn't really portable at the time. Surprisingly, the complexity of the build wasn't really a problem. 
After all, because of the way that Selenium RC worked, the language bindings were mostly dependent on the XSLT. Once it was working, the real action happened either in the server, which was written in Java, or in the injected JavaScript, which was shared. Put another way, if the build worked in Java, it probably worked everywhere. And that meant the only people who needed to worry about the complexity of the entire build were the ones doing a release. Now, WebDriver started in 2007 as a small open source project independent of Selenium. I knew from the start that I wanted to support multiple different languages and that I'd need to compile them all in a single build. So I went hunting for the right tool. The problem is, at the time, there weren't really any great choices for a polyglot build tool. Ant and Maven existed for Java, but they really didn't handle Python or C-sharp well, if at all. MS Build and Nant were great for your .NET projects, but when it came to Ruby or Java, no good. So I looked around for a solution, and the one I settled on was Rake, which is a, a Ruby build tool. Um, why Rake? Well, well, Rake is ideally suited to building Ruby gems, has the interesting property that it's a DSL for describing builds, and each Rake build is itself a Ruby program. That means that it's entirely possible to extend the DSL with custom types of build artifact, providing you can figure out how to express that compilation in code or as a shell script. Better yet, Ruby makes it easy to execute random shell commands. The original build for WebDriver then consisted of a single build file, a rake file, which declared some helper functions and then just ran a fairly simple build. Bah, I say fairly simple. But as the project grew and the number of browsers and languages we supported expanded, this rake file became increasingly terrifying. In the end, there was only one person on the project who felt comfortable working on it, and that was me. Clearly, the situation had become completely untenable. We needed to find another way of doing things. By this time, I was working at Google, which had a really impressive build system. The way that builds at Google worked, and I believe still work, is there are build files scattered all over the source tree. While there are a lot of build files, it's easy to see how they link together, and I mean that changes in one part of the tree don't affect changes in another. The other nice thing with the build files was that rather than describing a set of steps to perform, they contained a description of the outputs that would be produced, a Java library here or a Python binary there. Each of these outputs listed the inputs it needed, it looked very much like a series of Python calls, and that's because originally they were Python calls. These ideas of scattering build files through the tree and having them describe the outputs to be built were utterly, utterly brilliant, and I loved it. So I asked if I could open source that idea, and the open source people at Google had no problem with it. By now, we'd merged with WebDriver and Selenium into one project called Selenium. We still use Rake for the project's combined builds, and you'll remember that Rake builds are essentially a DSL that executes a Ruby program. You can do whatever you want within that structure. So I did. Using a parser generator called Gradle, I described the build grammar I wanted, and then I implemented that as a series of Ruby functions. The build started by finding all these build.desk files in the tree, and then use those to generate Rake targets using a target syntax that looked remarkably like Bazel's does today. Once that was done, we just let Rake do its thing. On this slide, you can see one of the build.desk files. But there was a problem. We'd accidentally written a not entirely awful polyglot build tool at this point. But the Selenium team has never been huge, and we already had our hands full maintaining what was rapidly becoming an extremely popular and large open source project. We didn't really have the time or energy to support a second project. So we used some social engineering to make sure that no one would try and extract and use the build tool we had in Selenium for themselves. We gave it a ridiculous name that described how much I'd enjoyed working on it. And we called it Crazy Fun. Crazy Fun was all well and good, but it had some drawbacks. We never really got parallel builds working properly. So although we could build anything, we could only build that anything very slowly. And that's suboptimal. By this time, I joined Facebook, and there had met up with Michael Bolin, who'd also worked at Google. Now, an interesting thing with the Zoodle diaspora is that many of us miss the wonderful tooling that Google have. Michael was no exception, and he was missing Blaze, their build tool. Rather than moping, he'd created a new build tool called Buck, which was rapidly gaining usage within Facebook. 
It shared the concept of build files scattered through the tree and also had a very familiar syntax for its build files. Best of all, it was optimized for speed on a developer's machine and could automatically parallelize work by analyzing how targets within the build files related to each other. The question I asked was, what if crazy fun delegated a buck wherever possible and just handled the bits of the build buck couldn't? It turns out it wasn't hard to wire the two together with crazy fun delegating to buck where possible. And suddenly Selenium builds were a lot faster. This was joyous. Coding was fun again. At this point, it sounds like we had everything sorted out, right? But if that's the case, why is this talk called CI with Basil? Well, while Buck was definitely a step forward, it wasn't ideal. Why not? Well, there are plenty of reasons, but one of the most important technical reasons was that extending Buck was extremely difficult. When we had been working on Buck at Facebook, adding an extension mechanism had always been a high priority, but never quite made it to the top of the list. That meant the only way to extend Buck was to fork it and to add your own extension to Buck's own source before compiling a fork and uploading it somewhere. Being able to extend our build was really important for Selenium. We were building things that people at Facebook just didn't need, like Zippy for Firefox and .NET code. In addition, the Selenium team had been very patient humoring me with various build systems, but it was clear that people would be happier using something that other people knew. And that leads me to the other reason for moving away from Buck, the social ones. The frankly weird build system that Selenium had made it really hard to find help when it went wrong. There was no way to find the answer to your problem on Stack Overflow. There was no one to ask for help other than the uh, Selenium developers themselves. We really wanted a build system that had an active and vibrant community. A build system where we could ask questions and where Stack Overflow might be able to help. Community matters. Sadly, from the outside, it also looks like Buck has basically ground to a halt, and it never really had a large community built around it for any number of reasons. I'm really looking forward to the rumored Buck 2 that's coming out at some point, but for now, the version of Buck that Selenium used looks like a dead end. So we decided to look for another build tool entirely, one that was well supported, fast, flexible, and good enough for Selenium. What criteria did we use to assess the build tool? Stepping all the way back, let's answer the question of what a build actually is. Regardless of your language of choice, we can think of it as a process of transforming the original source code into something we can ship to our users. Be that like a binary, like the Selenium server, libraries people can depend on, or just a simple script that we can run to do something interesting. If you're using a compiled language, such as Java, Go, or Rust, one of these transformations is to invoke the compiler to generate binary outputs. For JavaScript folks, one transformation might be concatenating all the source files based on inputs, and another might be tree shaking to reduce the size of the generated JavaScript. Another kind of transformation would be to take generated outputs and package them up into zips or jar files. If we tilt our heads and squint a little, we can even say that running tests is one of these transformations. After all, we take test code and transform it into a series of passes and failures. Now, behind the scenes, Build tools typically attempt to reduce work by looking at the inputs of each step of the build. And if those inputs haven't changed, they simply skip the step. Well, what inputs are they, should we be considering? Well, let's take the case of using NPM to compile some TypeScript. The obvious inputs we think about are the actual source files, but we've all run into the problem where we, uh, the build works on one machine, but not another. So that can't be all there is to it, right? One reason, is a tooling such as the TypeScript compiler is present on one machine, not on another. So the TypeScript compiler is an input, but they fix bugs between releases. So I guess the version of the compiler also matters. The version is an input too. Because these inputs aren't normally stated, we can think of them as implicit inputs. Worse, compilers can be affected by things like the command line flags used or even environment variables or the OS you're running on. These are more implicit inputs, and very few build tools enumerate them properly. This is one of the reasons we all suffer so much from works on my machine. So in the ideal build system, we'd have a way of listing not only the obvious, but the implicit dependencies. Another thing to bear in mind is that the outputs of one function are inputs to another. We need to properly track what's being produced rather than just dumping it out on the disk and hoping for the best. Not tracking this stuff properly is one of the major reasons we need to run clean builds. 
And those are incredibly wasteful if we do them and risky if we don't. I guess we better add that to our list of things for an ideal build system, track outputs. Another implicit input is when we're running our build. Try and resolve the latest version of some dependency you use right now, like Selenium, and you'll get one version. Try the same thing in six months, you'll likely get another version entirely. Well, how do we handle this? With lock files. These allow one person in one place at one time to figure out which particular set of dependencies play nicely together and write that down somewhere we, where we can check into the build. This means that subsequent builds don't need to take the time to do the same dependency resolution, meaning a faster build. And we've also removed the importance of the exact time and date where the build is being run. This is such a good idea that almost all modern build systems have some mechanism for creating, sharing, and using lock files. Clearly, the ideal build system would do this too. Once we've nailed down implicit inputs, our next problem is we need to be able to tell whether the input has actually changed or not. One common way to do this is to take a look at the time where the input was last modified, the M time. If that's later than the last time a particular output that was, uh, was generated from it, then clearly it's dirty and we should regenerate the output. That's the way Make, Maven and Gradle all work, by looking at the end time. But this isn't a great way to do things. It's all too easy to get the modified timestamps out of line with the derived outputs, causing us to either under or overbuild. Either way is not great. What else could we do? Well, the thing that really matters is what's in the input files, right? We don't actually care when they were modified, just that they've been changed. The way that this problem is commonly solved is by hashing the file and using the hash to figure out if the file has changed. There are plenty of fast hashing algorithms out there, and there are ways we can avoid having to read the entire file system each time we do a build. So, although this might be a bit slower than looking at the end time, the reduction in rework is enough to make this a really good way of figuring out whether something has changed. Our ideal set build system will hash inputs rather than relying on the modification time. There's another thing we'd like from our ideal build system, that each step, that for each step, the same inputs lead to the same output. Why is that something we'd like? At the simplest level, it makes caching a lot easier, but meaning that we can do less work in our builds. Now, sometimes some non-determinism in outputs is unavoidable. I'm looking at you, C compilers. But most modern tool chains for most languages we care about make this possible. So our ideal build system will do its best to make sure that each step of the build is what's known as a pure function. Given the same inputs, it will always give you the exact same output. Now, we know the hashes of all our inputs, and we also believe we have a build where the same inputs lead to the same outputs, we can start doing some pretty clever things. For a start, it's possible to store each and everything we produce in content addressable storage, using keys derived from hashes of the inputs. If you're not familiar with content addressable storage, just think of it as a giant dictionary, a hash. A key points to a specific value and output. We could host that on some central server, and then everyone in the team who's trying to build the same thing could take advantage of the work that's already been done. Better yet, if our listing of the implicit inputs is sufficiently good, there's no reason to be constrained to just running on our local machine. Why not just have a fleet of boxes running in the cloud, each of which can reach into the shared cache, grab the inputs it needs, run the build steps contained in a single pure function before uploading the results into the cache again? That way, you could run hundreds of build steps at the same time, and everything would go faster still. It would be nice if our ideal build system supported remote caching and through that, distributed builds. There's something we ran into really quickly with Selenium, but more and more people are running into now. Our builds are seldom just one language. It's not uncommon to have a JavaScript front end talking to backends written in Java, Go, or Rust, or maybe all three. Maybe using protocol buffers to define the shape of the data and the RPCs that can be used. And then we want to be able to run these things locally, but also package them as Docker images. We need almost all these things in the Selenium project. Our repo contains code written in JavaScript, Java, Python, C Sharp, and Ruby. Each of these languages use fragments of JavaScript compiled down to the small lumps of reusable code, those atoms. So we all need to consume JavaScript. The Java build features a web-based front end written in React, and the language bindings also have code generated from CDP definitions, which are stored as JSON. We want to be able to test by deploying the grid in a fully distributed mode to a local Kubernetes cluster. There are so many interdependencies and so much shared code between the languages that separating the repos would be a tragic waste of effort. 
If we relied on language specific build tools, the number of tools would be mind boggling. Weaving them all together to produce a cohesive and sensible whole would be a daunting task and one that most people would quite rightly avoid if at all possible. Ah, crazy fun already offered us the ability to run Java tests with the same ease as JavaScript tests or Python ones. We could already build things like Python wheels, Ruby gems, and Java jars. We quite liked the build files being easy to work with, with a common syntax being used, no matter which language we were building with. Our ideal build system would retain this polyglot nature and the simple build files. We're asking a lot of this build system, right? It'd be like finding a unicorn, right? Now, there's a slew of new build tools appearing recently, but the one we settled on was Bazel. Originally, this was called Blaze and was part of Google's secret source for dealing with their massive monorepo. It meets many of the criteria we have for our ideal build system, tracks inputs and outputs carefully, so we seldom need to run clean. Each build step in the build, called an action, attempts to be a pure function and often succeeds in being so. It works with all the languages we support, although the .NET supporter is shaky at best. It's also something someone else is working on. There's a wealth of support options available and plenty of answers on Stack Overflow. There's another reason why making the jump to Bazel was good for us. It made getting started building the project significantly less painful. Using Bazel means there are fewer dependencies that need to be on the developer's machine. We now use pinned versions of Python, Ruby, and the JDKs used to compile the project, as well as pinned versions of the NPM and all of our third-party dependencies. We even have pinned versions of Firefox, Chrome, and Edge, as well as the drivers for each of these browsers. That means that someone new to the project doesn't need to have all these things already installed before getting something done. Instead, they need to install Bazelisk, which is a widely used wrapper for Bazel that allows us to pin the version of Bazel we use, the .NET developer tools, the various runtime libraries for browsers need, or they're not the browsers themselves, and Python 3, which we transparently call from a script to run before every build. It took us a while to fully adopt Bazel, and members of the Selenium team have been responsible for improving many of the language-specific Bazel rule sets we use. It's not always been fun to get there, but we made the leap, and now many of the rough edges have been smoothed. All this means that getting started on the Selenium build is a lot easier than it used to be. But there's another reason for picking Bazel, and that is it opens up some really interesting possibilities for our CI builds. A lot of this rests on the fact we can query the build graph. The build what now? Graphs are really useful data structures. They represent nodes that are connected to one another with lines. Think of a subway map and you've got an idea of what a graph might look like. The kind of graph we're interested in is an acyclic, uh, directed acyclic graph. Directed means there are lines connecting each node and that gives them a direction. And acyclic means that there's nowhere in the graph where if you follow the lines in the direction they point, you'd be able to make a circle. You can imagine your build describes one of these directed acyclic graphs. Now, some build tools use a really coarse uh, build graph, but Bazel likes to have a very fine grained one. And why is that? The nice thing is with graphs is there are some really well-known algorithms for figuring out how to parallelize operations on each node of the graph. The finer the build graph, the better the chances parallelism can be used, the faster our builds. Within the Selenium project, we aim for a single build file per Java package. On this slide, you can see a simplified build graph generated by Bazel of the dependencies of the core WebDriver APIs. Each node has a label attached to it. These begin with a double slash, have a path, and then a colon followed by another string. And they tell us exactly where in the source tree each target is. I said it was important for us to be able to easily extend our build tool. Bazel does make this easy by allowing us to write extensions in the form of our own build rules. Here's one from the Selenium project. Bazel rules are written in a Python-like language called Starlark. Notice that if you're comfortable with Python, you'll feel pretty comfortable straight away. If you're not, then Starlark has taken away much of the complexity to make the programming model even lighter. Don't worry too much about what this rule does, but the interesting thing is that each rule is composed of a series of actions. In this, we create two actions. The first creates a directory, and the second runs a shell script. So to the user, the build is composed of a series of rules that are tied together in the build files. But under the covers, the build is actually a series of actions, each of which can be executed when their inputs are ready for them. This allows Bazel to have an even more finely grained uh, build than it otherwise would. And again, allows us to go just a little bit faster. So let's assume you've checked out the Selenium project. How does one build 
for example, everything in the Java and Python trees. Easy, like this. Notice that we're building both languages at the same time with the same Bazel build command. The build is also pulling in various bits of JavaScript to make things work the way we expect them to. This is an actual build of Selenium. For me, on my machines, a clean build can take about two to three minutes, but here I've already partially built some stuff, notably the React UI, so the build is a lot faster, uh, only taking about 11 seconds in the end. Now let's run all the smallest tests we have for Python and Java. I could do the other languages, but I think this shows the idea. It only takes about a minute to build everything and run, and you'll see there's a failing test in there if you've got keen eyes. One thing that Bazel is doing here is it's automatically parallelizing the test for us, so we're using my machine as efficiently as possible. If you've keen eyes, you'll see that some of the tests haven't been run, they've been cached. That's because I ran a subset of these earlier before recording the video. Bazel knows that I've not changed anything and the test passed before, so it's not running them again, which is probably what you'd hope a build system would do. I don't need to know anything other than the fact the tests are there to be run. Even though I'm running both Python and Java tests, the same command is used to run them. This means that anyone on the team can make a change, change in the shared JavaScript, and rerun all the affected tests without needing to know how to do this on a per language basis. It's a really powerful thing. So now you know a lot more about Selenium, why we chose Bazel and the journey we took to get started using it. Along the way, we made plenty of contributions to the Bazel project and the rule sets we used. I'm really proud that the Selenium team has had a positive impact, and I hope that some of you get to benefit from the work we did. But this talk isn't about the history of the Selenium project and the why and how we did our migration. No, we're also here to talk about CI with Bazel using Selenium as the example we'll talk about. So, continuous integration. For the sake of this discussion, I'll ignore the CI builds where we were still marrying crazy fun in Bazel and instead focus on just the Bazel bits. Guess we should start at the beginning. The Bazel migration took a long time when we started it and we did it in stages, starting with Java. When we started our Bazel CI builds the way that many teams do, by running Bazel test dot dot dot, test everything, and saying the build passed when it was green. This approach has the advantage of staggering simplicity. With it, you know that everything builds and that everything passes, or, you know, doesn't. The approach worked well, but the machines that our GitHub Actions run on are pretty underpowered, so we decided to make a few changes. Remember, the Selenium repo is a polyglot repo with different languages being broken out into different top level directories. It's simple enough to create a workflow per language and fan out. So rather than Bazel test everything, it's possible to run Bazel test everything on the Python, Bazel test everything on the Java. If caching had been set up right, then if those tests turned out to be a no op, then they'd finish pretty quickly since it would just be hitting the cache. A simple heuristic we could have used is to simply check the top level directory of every file within a given PR and just run the per language workflows for those. Uh, but there's a few problems with that. The first is that occasionally we'd modify a, modify a file that wasn't under a particular top level directory, which didn't have a matching language specific workflow. I guess it's not much of a problem because then you just do nothing and let the build pass, right? Except then you hit the second problem. Sometimes those top level files actually matter. You do want to run those per language workflows. As an example, bumping the .bazel version file to contain the latest version of Bazel should really force all the tests to run. Related to this, sometimes there's code in one tree that affects the others. Most often this happens in the Java tree where the grid server is used by the tests of the other languages and the JavaScript tree where there's a substantial body of shared code. So language specific workflows are great, but we needed a more sophisticated mechanism for indicating what we should do. It would be nice if we could use Bazel's build graph. We already know that Bazel maintains a build graph. It also provides a query command that allows us to introspect that graph. As an example, while I was preparing this talk, I noticed that if I change the color class from the support package, loads of tests are run. It's not obvious why. Let's ask Bazel and see if it can help. First of all, we want to get a list of the tests that need to be run if the color class changes. Then we'll pick one of those and find out the path between that test and color. I don't know about you, but I find text quite hard to read when it's like this. So let's generate an image with a graph in so we can actually see the reason. I know we're going quite fast here, but the idea I'm trying to get across is that Bazel allows you to easily introspect the graph 
And this opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities for us. Don't worry if you miss the details, as long as you have the idea. And here you can see why the tests depend on color. It's because it goes through this drivers module, which is used by all of our uh, tests. Fantastic, it's good to know that. This idea of querying the build graph to figure out what's changed is often called target determination. A target determinator is a tool that identifies the files that have changed between two revisions of a code base, then runs a series of queries to identify the targets that have been affected. Each of the language specific workflows we have is gated by a script, which is very heavily based on a similar script used by Bazel itself in its own CI builds. You can see the meat of the script on this slide here. For each file in the PR, we identify the matching Bazel targets. We then do uh, look up the reverse dependencies of each of those targets in the entire repo before filtering that to a list um, to identify only tests. Once we have that list of test targets, then we can compute with the per language prefix. And if and only if there's a match there, we can allow the per language workflow to continue. And that's where we are now. If you're thinking of adopting Bazel, you can uh, also adopt some of the tooling we've created around the project. Specifically, the idea of target determination can take a traditional build pipeline of run all the small tests, then run the medium test, do some fanning out, fanning in, packing things up, <laughs> and turn it into a far more focused process. By running only the specific subset of tests you need, your average CI times can drop dramatically. On one project I worked on, build times dropped by an average of about 40%, with P90 build times dropping from two hours to about 20 minutes. But there are some things we could do to go even faster and have our builds be even more precise. The first of these is to improve our target determinator. The one we have is fine, but it misses some pretty important edge cases, such as when we change the pinned version of Bazel. Fortunately, as part of the Bazel Contrib GitHub, or GitHub organization, there's now a rather nice target determinator that's being actively worked on and is used by a few projects. It'd be really nice to adopt this. In the demo I'm about to do, this open source project is the second tool I use. It's the binary called Target Determinator. Look, here's a demo of it in action on a recent Selenium commit. You can see that when we run the current Target Determinator, it returns an error, and so we don't run any tests. Now, the change that we're looking at only changes the IE driver, but we don't build that with Bazel since it's effectively frozen. Because of that, we're not expecting to see any files to be detected uh, to, that are changed to cause any tests to run. Now, you'll notice that the second target determinator appears to be a lot slower than the first one. Part of this is because it's actually working. Bazel didn't get an, even get a chance to do any work at previously. But the other reason is the second target determinator is doing a lot more work, as it's comparing both the current and previous versions of the repo to make sure that nothing is falling through the cracks. The trade-off with completeness is speed. Well, given that our CI builds can take an hour, identifying that no two targets, uh, no targets need rebuilding has saved us an awful lot of time. We'll just let this finish running. I think it's nearly done now. It appears to be uh, querying the uh, state of the project after the change has been made. It's all very exciting watching a script run, isn't it? And you will see. Just a few seconds more. There we go. After a minute, it figured out nothing needed to be done. We saved an hour. I've mentioned it's possible to run Bazel tests remotely. Now, there are a handful of open source projects that allow you to set up and manage your own distributed build grid, like Selenium's build grid, uh, uh, Selenium grid, you know? I've been using BuildBarn recently, and it's been great for us at work, but for an open source project, I'm not particularly keen on running the infrastructure required for a Bazel build grid. Given that we're all Selenium users, I guess most of us are familiar with companies such as Source Labs and BrowserStack that offer Selenium as a service. Fortunately, there are also build as a service offerings that are starting to appear. One that I like is called Engflow, and I have a fork of the Selenium project that can use it. Just as before, we're going to run our tests. But now, rather than running them locally, I'm going to run them on Engflow's distributed build grid. It's as simple as adding one more flag to the Bazel command, telling it to use the Engflow config. Now, one thing this allows us to do is to run more tests than I can on my regular machine, because there are hundreds of tests, and these can scale horizontally. But the uh, other thing is that we can share work easily. In this example of us running the same build, we're using two different machines. I'm using separate doc containers, but there's nothing shared. You can see this 
plugging away. Now I, I started running this test while I was talking because this remote, uh, this retry request test takes quite a long time to run. Now settle down, make yourselves comfortable. You'll see that we've run 653 tests. Scrolling up, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna copy the command that I use to run these commands, uh, these tests. And uh, you will also notice the host name begins with 48F. Here, we're on a different host. There's nothing shared between these machines other than the Interflow distributed build cache. They could be on different, different computers, different planets, it doesn't matter. Different planets would be really impressive. When Bazel starts, all it does is it um, takes a look at its workspace and it figures out what's in those build files and what it has to go and build. And then for everything, it goes up to the remote end and it goes, have you built this already? Have you done this already? Have you done this already? And you'll see that's what it's doing now. These tests are coming through really fast now. Already like a third of the way through, quarter of the way through, third of the way through. That thing there being built is the React UI front end for the grid. And you'll see here that zero out of 653 tests needed to be run again because they were all cached. Imagine that in your CI builds. Now, our local build times using Basil are already pretty good. With remote builds enabled, I think we can get these wickedly fast build times. That's why if I had to choose between a better target to terminate or being able to do dist distributed builds, I'd always plump for distributed builds. But our time is drawing to a close. Perhaps I should start wrapping up? Selenium is a complicated project with lots of languages. Would Bazel be a good fit for you? Let's look at the downsides first. Most importantly, there's the learning curve. If you have access, access to someone who's used Bazel successfully before, it's a lot easier to get started. If you've not got access to a local expert, then I'd be cautious for now. The nice thing is the pool of people who are familiar with Bazel is growing all the time. It's already less of a problem than it was when Selenium adopted the tool. And that's a situation that's only going to improve. The next rough edge with Bazel is that writing build files can be hard. Fortunately, that's also changing pretty rapidly. There are build file generators for Protopuffs, Go, Python, and Java. If you're interested in exploring this area, the tool the Bazel community is working with it's called Gazelle. It's well worth a look. Another problem is that pinning everything comes at a cost. Downloading all those tool chains and third-party dependencies can lead us needing to download hundreds of megabytes of stuff before the very first line of code can be compiled. Wasting all that time is dull, and it's worse because we can't really do anything until it finishes. Well, at least we only need to do this once when it's a fresh checkout, or when someone updates a dependency. That doesn't happen often. It's also possible to reduce this cost by having caches which are stored between Bazel builds. Now, I will note it's not a problem unique to Bazel. Anyone who's using a modern Java or JavaScript build tool will be familiar with long pauses as they download all the required dependencies or do dependency resolution. It's true that Bazel's approach leads to more things being downloaded, but at the end of the day, it typically is a cost we seldom have to pay. Now, some tool chains like Go's are incredibly quick already. And adopting Bazel for them isn't such an obvious win. But the moment you need to start needing something to coordinate steps, perhaps if you want to generate some files, then any build tool starts to look more useful. And if your project is going to grow and develop over time, and you're going to use multiple languages, then considering Bazel becomes an option. IDE support for Bazel isn't great. If you're on the happy path of working with Java, C++, or Go, you'll be OK. But once you're off that path, it gets less comfortable. Fortunately, the plugins for both IntelliJ and VS Code are improving, and support is getting better with each release of these plugins. The other day, JetBrains announced that they were taking on co-maintainership of the IntelliJ plugin. And finally, Google uses Linux for almost everything, and there are very few people there using Windows. Bazel is derived from Google's own Blaze build tool, and so it has a strong Unix bias. It works great on Mac OS, but Windows can be a bit of a struggle. If first-class window support is something you need, Bazel isn't for you. Now, lots of the Bazel docs talk about how great it is at massive scale, and plenty of the Bazel advocates, myself included, are monorepo fans. But it scales down too. This is largely to do with it doing better rebuilds and being able to selectively run subsets of tests. If there's access to a build grid, then the point where build speed improves comes even sooner. Another massive benefit is the simplicity of the shared command line for building, running, and testing. Just knowing that to build something, I need to use build, and to test something as test is conceptually simple. And because Bazel does such a good job of caching, 
I typically just choose to test, test everything. And one of the nice things about Basil's build files is they're language agnostic. That means that if I can read one, I can figure out how the various bits of the build hang together without needing a deep knowledge of how multiple tools work. Again, it makes it easier to work in a polyglot repo, but it also makes it easier to switch between repos in the same company that all use Bazel. One is easy, if one project is using Java or Kotlin, one's in JavaScript and another is in Go, no biggie. As engineering, as engineering organizations get larger, that ability to move smoothly from repo to repo becomes more important. Because Bazel pins dependencies, there's far less variance between uh, what one developer is using and another. Couple that with the being able to build remotely, and you can dramatically reduce the number of cases where something works on my machine, but not someone else's. The number of engineering hours I've seen this say has already been incalculable. As you saw earlier, builds are ultimately defined as actions, and these have all their inputs and outputs defined. This means that if you have access to a Bazel grid, you can use it for anything that Bazel supports. You've seen examples of that today when we did the distributed builds. Such a powerful thing to do and so useful when you have access to it, it's hard to go back to building locally. And remember, the nice thing is that Bazel is a lot like Selenium, in that if you wanted to, you could set up and manage your own grid, but you want to have someone else manage the updates, make sure the latest versions of things available, handle the security side of things and ensure the uptime of the system. Well, there are options already available for you that you can turn to. So, I hope you found this talk interesting and informative. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope there's enough time left over for some questions, but if there's something you need to ask, just come and find me on the Hangout or on the Selenium or Basil Slack channels. I'm on both of those things publicly. And I'll be happy to help you as much as I can. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Simon. Uh, I see four questions in the Q&A section. So if you still have questions, folks, please use the Q&A section. We'll take uh, about five minutes. We'll go through a few questions. And of course, like Simon mentioned, he'll be available on the Hangout for more questions. Uh, if you're raising your hand, uh, you know it, it, it might be helpful to just put in the questions and we take it from there. All right, so here we go. Uh, Simon, I'm just gonna read out the questions on my screen. Sure. What are all the upcoming plans for Selenium web driver development in the next two years? Um, so I sat down as project lead, so uh, it's not up to me anymore. But I definitely know that on the list is support for what's known as web driver by die. So uh, the original web driver uh, model is a request response one where the test sends out a, a request to the browser. It does something, the response comes back. But that doesn't allow you to do um, bi-directional communication. Sometimes it's useful to get events from the browser, like um, are there error logs being executed by Java, by JavaScript? Like we'd like to get those back. Um, watching the lifecycle of the page, um, doing request interception and stuff like that. So uh, the WebDriver by die spec is an attempt to allow that bi-directional communication to come through. Um, and it's being worked on by uh, Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, Apple are involved, like all the major browser vendors are involved. Um, and it'll it'll come soon. Um, if you're using Selenium 4, you can already get a taste of some of the things that we're planning on offering by taking a look at inter, uh, interfaces such as like Network Interceptor, for example, in the Java bindings. Um, but I think that's like the big feature. Cool. All right. And there will be certainly be a lot more talks about what's coming up, uh, you know, in the main conference. So please do attend that if you're more interested in some of these topics. Uh, moving to the next one, uh, how, uh, in your view, uh, how would you compare, uh, you know, UI automation tools like Cypress, WebDriver, IO to Selenium? Like, how competent do you think they are? Uh, I have opinions. Um, I think the Cypress model, Cypress does a really nice developer experience. Like, the UI is nice, the idea it has is nice, the fact everything is packaged up reduces the amount of thought you have to put in. But fundamentally, the technology is based on what we abandoned with Selenium RC. Like attempting to inject things in, as JavaScript into the page is incredibly painful. And they've only just managed to land support for navigating between domains. And when we did that with Selenium RC, it was painful, man. Like they're just going to run into more and more problems. Um, things like uh, Puppeteer and Playwright are interesting. They use a bi-directional communication. 
Um, they take some shortcuts, so it looks like they start suit faster than Selenium does. But if you put them into the same mode, they're about the same speed. Um, but the problem with both of those is they're tied to specific versions of specific browsers rather than being a general tool. So you can't take the test you wrote today and run it with the current version of Chrome, the next version of Chrome, the current version of Edge, the next version of Edge, and so on and so forth, and also Safari and Firefox, right? So you're limited in your testing options. Um, I think the capabilities that BIDI offers will mean that the things that you can do with those frameworks rapidly become less of a differentiator, like Selenium will be able to do all those things. Cool. There's a question from, so, uh, so far the questions were anonymous, so I didn't read out the names, but uh, there's a next question is from Mahesh. He's uh, asking again about Playwright. Uh, Playwright already uh, is taking up the API integration. So any plans of having API integration in future in Selenium? Um, you're asking the wrong person. Like the, the, the technical leadership committee of Selenium is the right people to ask, um, and they would be able to help. Um, I think Diego is speaking later today. He's he's on the, the TLC. Cool. Uh, one question from Madan. Uh, after completion of your session, I would, uh, I think he's asking something more specific about a problem he's facing with the uh, Chrome 103 driver uh, and .NET. So I, I guess, uh, you know, Madan, if you can join the Hangout table, uh, you might be able to deep dive with Simon. Uh, you know, is it would be even better if he joined the public Selenium Slack channel and asked for help there. Um, like, well, I haven't had, I haven't run into this issue, and I don't use .NET, so debugging that is going to be quite complicated for me. But people who are on the public Slack channel um, will be able to do it. In order to go there, go to selenium.dev um, and then click on support, and then one of the options is like join the public Slack, and that's where you'll be able to get like the best help. Perfect. All right, we'll take one last question and then we'll move to the Hangout. Uh, again, from anonymous attendee, can we have the video recording facility in Selenium WebDriver? Uh, if you use Selenium Grid, you already have it. Like it's there as an option. Um, so uh, use Selenium Grid um, or use something like Browser Stack or Source Labs, which also offer the ability to have videos recorded of your tests. Perfect. All right, I think with that, uh, we'll wrap up this session. Uh, thanks again, Simon, uh, this evening for spending time with us. Uh, it's always great to uh, hear your insights from uh, you know, the Selenium project. Uh, so I'll now kind of wrap up the session. Thanks again, everyone for joining as well. Uh, we will now move to the Hangout tables, uh, meet Simon over there. See you later. Thank you, bye-bye.